Good. You ate a bunch of mashed potatoes like Sam. Gravy. Over full of mashed potatoes and gravy. My family, uh, went, we went to Montana for Thanksgiving. We drove to Montana. We drove back from Montana since we were in church last Sunday. I don't know how many of you have driven to Montana before. 2,900 plus miles later, that's a lot of, lot of window time. And so uh, I was excited to be able to come back and be here in church this morning. And, uh, but we had a great time, got to uh, drive through a lot of snow, and we brought some snow with us. How many of you are happy about that? All right. It wasn't so fun driving through it, but we made it. And uh, we, are, we are excited. Thanksgiving is behind us now, and we're less than a month till Christmas. Actually, Christmas is a month away from tomorrow. Nobody's excited about that. Shock and awe, Christmas is almost here. This is a hard thing for us to process sometimes. Time is going by so fast. Well, this morning we are wrapping up a series that we have just been in for the last uh, three Sundays on the blessed life. I hope that you've enjoyed this as we're talking about money. And uh, as we talk about money, uh, we kind of have a lot of mixed feelings about that, and you uh, might ask the question why we're doing that. I'm going to try to explain that in just a little bit. But uh, I want to just ask this question as we start uh, today. When we talk about money, when it comes to money, what are you good at? How many of you say you're good at spending money? You're good at spending it. Come on, don't, come on. You like to, you're good at spending money. How many of you would say that when it comes to money, you are a great bargain shopper? We got any bargain shoppers. My wife is coupon queen. She is all about the deals, all about, she, she will go to every store to get the deal. Um, I don't know if we're saving money in that, um, but uh, those who are bargain shoppers, you think about all the money that you're saving. You know, it's crazy that you've got to spend money to save money. It kind of sounds like our government. We've got to spend it to save it. I don't understand necessarily the, the logic in that, but I understand saving, saving money. Uh, last question is this. When it comes to money, how many of you say you're good at saving money? Okay, so we have a lot of hands in all of those three different uh, areas. It's interesting that as we look at the Scripture in the Bible, there's not a single Bible verse that talks about being good at shopping. There is not a Bible verse that talks about how we should be good at bargain shopping. And there's not a verse in the Bible that says that we should be great at storing up treasures here on earth. But there are a lot of verses that talk about it being great for us to give, being great at giving. So today I want to talk as we wrap this series up about generosity, generosity. I would say that this church is a very generous church. Over the history of our existence here, 33 years as a church, uh, there's been a lot of projects that we've been part of with missions. Uh, we have gone through four building programs and uh, here's one thing that uh, you may or may not have noticed or realized being around here for a period of time. Some of you might have been involved in other churches, going through a building program. Never once have we done a capital campaign. Never once have we got up in a building program and, and asked for people to commit to giving to this building program a certain amount of money. And then we calculate it and decide whether we're going to do it or not. Over the, over the time that uh, New Hope has existed, we've had four building uh, projects along the way. I've been here for three of those. I came in right at the end of the first one when we built the sanctuary over here, um, the 400-seat sanctuary. We often call it the Green Sanctuary. And I came in uh, right after, after we had moved into that building, maybe two years after that. And, uh, but I do remember in, in the year 2000, we were or it might have been 1999, I should have asked Pastor Weaver all the details about this, but we were looking at finishing the uh, mortgage on that building that we had moved into just about four or five years before. And we were planning this big on our anniversary Sunday to pay off the mortgage on that building. And then Pastor Weaver ended up going to Ethiopia. 
And God had put it on his heart to receive an offering for the Bible college in Ethiopia. And in that offering, we gave over $65,000, which would have been a significant part of uh, what could have helped us toward the uh, paying off of that building. So we decided, more important than that, it was incredible, the generous offering that came in. We weren't expecting that. I know Pastor Weaver was nervous about that. And uh, there was a generous offering that was given that that Sunday, and from their missions giving in our church uh, just skyrocketed. And before we ever got, probably a year before that mortgage uh, was due, we paid, it, we paid it off completely as well as giving that offering. So your generosity has been shown over and over, and we've been able to pay off buildings within three, four years after, after uh, building them and moving into them, and we are believing the same thing for our new addition over here. But it just shows the generosity of, of you as a congregation when we haven't asked for anything toward that. We'll do it a building fund offering on our anniversary Sunday. Uh, you might have been here for that. We don't push that. But we just ask that you would consider what God would have you to give in any of these kind of offerings. So we're a generous church, and we are a church made up of people who are extremely generous. And I know that not everyone is excelling at this gift of generosity. But I truly believe that most people in their hearts want to be generous. I'm asking you this question today for you to ask yourself, am I, am I a generous person? You might be looking at uh, your own situation, looking at the economy, looking at inflation, and and, uh, looking at your own um, circumstances, thinking, you know, I'm just not ready to be generous yet. And by generosity, we've learned about giving. We've learned last week, if you missed Pastor Austin's message on tithing, tithe comes first. That's what we give our first fruits to God, the first 10%, paying our tithes and then giving beyond that. And that is where generosity comes in. And you might be looking at that going, I'm just not quite ready to be generous yet. I've got to get this, this uh, uh, tithing part down first. Um, maybe you're thinking if my income was just a little bit higher or I had a, a, a greater balance in my bank, then I could be generous. Maybe if I didn't have so much debt, when I get that taken care of, then then I plan to be generous. There might be people who have the resources to be generous, but you're just um, looking at things that are going on in the world and and, uh, trying to figure out when the time is to start being generous. And I want to challenge all of us this morning in this series on giving as we wrap it up to grow in this area of generosity. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Those are Jesus' words. The God that we serve is a generous God. The Bible said God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. Why a series on giving? I, I can assure you that it's not because we are in need as a church. Pastor Zach said a couple of weeks ago, people get funny when we talk about money, like you're going, okay, where are you going? What are you asking? What are you going to do with this whole series talking about money? Here's the, here's the reality. There are principles in scripture that help us to become more like God. There are principles so that we can live the way that he intends for us to live. The scripture gives us uh, instructions on how to love, how to live, how to forgive, how to grow in our faith, how to process through trials, how to trust God daily to guide and provide for us. And it gives us instruction and principles on how to use our money. How we handle money is such an important thing for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, especially as Americans. We have been given so much God wants us to become generous, but generosity isn't easy because we live in a very materialistic, self-centered society. It's difficult. Money is a bigger test than you think, but God has a plan for our finances, and when we live according to those plans and those purposes concerning our money, then we find that we can really experience what it means to live a blessed life. So looking back over the past couple of weeks, Pastor Zach talked about the importance of giving, 
But God isn't so concerned about our money. He doesn't want our money. What he wants is our heart. He's concerned about our heart. Matthew chapter six says, don't store up treasures here on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust rust don't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He knows that your heart will follow your money. Your heart follows your treasure. What do you treasure in life? Wherever you put your money, that's where your heart will be. And God is really concerned and wants our heart. Pastor Austin talked about tithing, giving 10%, the first 10% out of obedience to God. And we realize that it all belongs to God. It's not my money. It's God's money. I'm a steward of what belongs to him. Malachi says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse And he follows that up by saying, I will open the windows of heaven and I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have room enough to take it in. And he follows up that by saying, try it, put me to the test. I don't know any other scripture uh, in the Bible that says, you test this out and try it. Put me to the test and see if I won't do this for you. That's what he's saying. In the NIV, he says, test me in this and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to store it. God wants our heart and God wants our obedience to him. This morning, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and that's where we're going to be, um, that's where we're going to be looking this morning. I love that we love God's word. One thing that I'll say while you're turning there is uh, for this series, there's a book that Robert Morris wrote, and I don't know how many of you have ever read this book, The Blessed Life, but if you're looking for a resource on really a godly perspective on your, on your finances and your giving, this is probably the gold standard. There's so much valuable uh, information in there and with just such a great heart. When it comes to money, you know, giving God our money, it's not about getting rich. It's not about giving and getting back. I mean, that's a principle of scripture. But the heart and the motive isn't that at all. And as we're looking at scripture this morning, I want you to see that God is generous toward us always. But a response from us to him is is generosity. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 6, Paul says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. It's why we don't pressure you to give. Because that's not a way to give. We're not to give under pressure. We're not to give reluctantly. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything that you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. And in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. In this passage of scripture, we've got the law of sowing and reaping. Paul says it in Galatians, a man reaps what he sows. We understand that living in an an agricultural part of the world, we understand sowing seeds and reaping a harvest. None of us, I mean, not many of us in the room probably are farmers. I know we have a few of them, but we understand this idea of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. That's the first principle that we get from that. You reap what you sow. You sow generously, meaning you throw a lot of seeds, you're gonna get a larger harvest. If you sow sparingly, you just sow a few seeds, your harvest is going to, To be sparing, you're going to have a sparingly, am I I saying that right? You're going to reap sparingly. It didn't sound quite right. This is what Paul said, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. He talks about where you sow, Paul does, that if you sow to please your sinful nature, you're going to reap 
destruction. You sow to please the Spirit, and you're going to reap eternal life. So it matters what we sow and where we sow it, but the reality is is that you're going to reap whatever you sow. Things multiply after their own kind. If you sow corn, what are you going to reap? What are you going to reap? Corn. You plant a seed of corn, you're going to reap corn. If you sow wheat, you're going to reap wheat. Can you imagine a farmer standing in a field in which he has sown wheat seeds and he's frustrated that corn is not coming up? What in the world? I wanted corn. What did you sow? You sowed wheat. That would be foolish. But I think that's what a lot of us do as believers. We will live a certain kind of a way, we'll sow certain kinds of seeds, and we expect something else to come up in our life. Or we don't sow anything, and we expect something's going to come after that. Here's the second part of the law of sowing and reaping. You reap after you sow. You reap after you sow. You sow first, and then you reap. That seems very self-explanatory. But how many of you have heard someone say this? Someday, when I have more money, then I'm going to become a giver. You can't reap before you sow. Imagine that same foolish farmer, like I said before, waiting for a crop to come in when he never planted any seeds. And he's saying to himself, once this crop comes up, I'm going to do some serious sowing. Y'all are looking at me like, that's stupid, that's dumb. It is. But we often will do that. We think things like this. If God will just help me uh, get this big deal and this big deal goes through, then I'm going to start giving to the church. But the Bible tells us that when we are faithful in a few things, when we are faithful in the small things, when we are faithful with very little, we can be trusted with much. When we are faithful in a few things, he will put us in charge of much greater things. Here's the reality. You have to start somewhere. And whenever you start sowing, you're going to reap a harvest. You reap what you sow. You reap after you sow. And here's the reality. You reap more than you sow. We understand you plant a seed of corn. You're going to grow a stalk of corn, hopefully, And on that stalk of corn is going to be one or two ears of corn. And on that ear of corn, how many seeds do you think are on an ear of corn? They say anywhere from 500 to 1,200. And so think about how much you've eaten when you eat an ear of sweet corn. (laughs) All of a sudden, it makes me full, thinking I've eaten at least about 800 kernels of corn on that one ear of corn that I've eaten but you plant one seed of corn and if you only got one one ear of corn on that on that stock that's 500 to 1200 seeds out of that one seed and sometimes there's two ears of corn you see that you reap more than you sow that's part of nature but it's the truth in God's kingdom you always get more than you sow it's not a get rich scheme But God provides blessing when we obediently give to him. There's a a passage of scripture that, that speaks to this. And I understand that this passage is often used to talk about money. And it's not in the context of money. But the principle applies. And it's Luke 6, 38 that says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. If you go back to the the previous verse, here's the context. He says, do not judge and you won't be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And then he goes in to give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. If you give, you know it's going to come back in kind. If you give forgiveness, not everyone is going to forgive you, but the tendency is if you're a forgiving person, people are going to be forgiving of you. If you're a generous person, people are going to be generous back with you. That's just the principle. Listen to what the message says, and I love the, the, the way it says this. He goes back to verse 37. Don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures or criticize their faults unless, of course, you want the same treatment. 
If you're going to be critical of other people, guess what? They're going to be critical with you. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. It's going to come right back to you. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Listen to this. Give away your life and you'll find life given back. But not merely given back, given back with bonus and with blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. I think it's very interesting that this message happens right now, right after Thanksgiving and right before Christmas. When we celebrate God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God was so generous toward us. And we have to realize that while we're in this weekend, where we're, we're right in the middle of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, I don't know how much Black Friday going to the store shopping, anybody do that this weekend? You're not going to admit that now that I'm talking about all of this. But I promise you, some of you were scrolling through Amazon this weekend. Probably last week. Black Friday sales started like Monday last week. You've got your shopping done because you found some great deals. You've got some bargain shoppers and you were saving your money. But here we are on this weekend where it, the, the, the world and the marketing world is appealing to our, our greediness, our selfishness, and the fact that uh, we're, we're looking out for ourselves. Proverbs 21, 26 says, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. So the enemy of generosity is selfishness, which we look at the day that we're in, materialism. Why did God create giving in the first place? Why does God want us to give? Some people might say because that way we can support the ministry that happens and so um, he'll have enough money for ministry and his work in the world. But the reality is, is God owns everything. We're going to see that in just a little bit. God created giving not for himself and not for his ministry. He created giving for us. He created giving for our sakes to root out greed and selfishness in our lives. Here's what I know. What you love, you will give to. You give to the things that you love. As parents, we love to help our kids. We give to our kids because we love our kids. If we didn't love our kids, they're on their own. Sometimes our kids need to get on their own anyway. And it's not that we don't love them. But you know what I'm saying. You give to the things that you love. And what you give to, you will end up loving. So you may not love something, but you find when you give to that, your heart follows where your giving is. Pastor Zach mentioned that. You know, you don't care a world, a lick in the world about the stock market market unless you've got money in the stock market and then you care a lot about what's happening with the stock market because your heart follows your money there's a battle between selfishness and generosity pastor zach mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in john chapter 12 the story of mary breaking the the jar of perfume on jesus And you remember in that story, Judas was really, really upset. And Judas, one of the disciples, said that that jar of perfume could have been sold for 300 denarii, which is a year's worth of wages. That, That perfume, instead of being wasted like that, could have been sold and given to the poor. I think it's interesting if you follow in that scripture, John, John chapter 12, Judas the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And listen to what John gives on the commentary. Not that he cared for the poor, not that John cared for the poor, he was a thief. So John's saying, listen, that should have been sold and given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor because he was a thief and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to that. Judas had a selfish heart. He was looking at that perfume being poured out on Jesus going, man, if that would have been sold, that money would have been in my money box that I'm taking care of for all the disciples. And he know, John said he was taking money for himself out of that. There's a selfishness in his heart. And so there's this battle between selfishness and generosity. And so the question is, how do we become great at being generous? 
How do you become great at being generous? And I would say that you have to plan for it. No one ever that I know of has ever said, I accidentally became generous. You have to plan on being generous. We're naturally selfish. We have to plan to be generous. Isaiah 32, 8 says, but generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. We plan for a lot of things. Some of you are planning for a vacation. Maybe your vacation is in the wintertime, and you're planning for a warm location for your vacation, but you're planning because there's financial commitment involved in your, in your vacation. Some of you uh, are in a season where you're planning for weddings for your children. We have to plan for those things. We plan to uh, do a remodel on our, on our home, but most people don't plan how they're going to give. Giving is mostly a spontaneous thing. We wait for our heart just to be like captured by some need or a missionary or some project or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But listen, if we don't make a plan, it probably isn't going to happen. So if we're only given spontaneously, then we're never going to be real great at being generous. We need a plan. So planning generosity Generosity is over and above what God requires, which is the tithe, the first 10%. Let me just say, right in this moment, reiterate what has been mentioned before. Our church is unique, and I don't think most churches operate this way, but we as pastors have no idea what you give. When Pastor Weaver started the church 33 years ago, it was set up that way that none of us, not even him, the founder of the church, knows what you give. We have no access to those records, nor do we ask, and you can ask Dale. We don't ask. We don't, we don't just say, hey, tell me if this person is a giver, because we don't want to know. What we want is you to, you to have that heart toward God and to become a giver, to be a tither, because that's between you and God. And blessing follows when we're obedient to God and when we give generously, he's generous with us as well. But the tithe comes first, that, that is an act of obedience and then offerings come and that's our generosity. So we have to plan for our generosity. Plan, how much should I give over my tithe? If you're not tithing, that's the first thing to tackle. 10%, and if you've not, not tried that, I would encourage you to do so. And Pastor Austin said last week, it might have to come in steps. I mean, it's hard to go from zero to to whatever, but if, if, if taking a step toward that, that's a step in the right direction. But here's what I would say. If you, if you can't live on 90%, chances are you're probably not going to be able to live on 100%. But God says when you can live on 90% and you give the first 10 to me, you've got your heart right. So ask yourself, how much should I give above the tithe? Is it an amount? Is it $500? Is it $1,000 or $5,000? Plan that. Plan how you're going to give that. Maybe you don't have a plan. You're saying, you know what? When the right thing comes, that's what I'm going to give to. I don't know how you do that. Or maybe it's a percentage. I'm going to give 10% in tithe, and I'm going to, I'm going to give 5% or 10% over uh, my tithe to, to give and be generous with. Maybe the question is, how much can I give? Some of you say, I really don't have much margin at all. When I first started in ministry, when I first started working a job out of college, someone had taught me, I had a class, and my dad and some other people had taught me, if you start saving money when you first start working, it's going to be the easiest thing for you to do. And then and as that works and compounds, it's going to grow a lot, a lot quicker. I decided I'm going to start giving to my retirement. My first job paid me $150 a week as a pastor full-time. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine how, how can I give to retirement, but I decided I had all these heads, these, these voices speaking in my head, you've got to start now, not wait till later. And so I started putting $5 a week into my retirement. That's because that's all I could think of. $15 tithe, $5 into retirement. That only leaves 130 left to live on. That's not a lot. But somehow we've made it in life. We made it through that time of life. We never have missed a bill in our married life. Thank the Lord. We've been able to live within our means and live beyond that and be, be generous. So how much can I give? How much should I give? How much should I keep? 
Going through our expenses. I don't know in the day, if you have a, a concern about this, but we live in this world of subscriptions. And it's easy to subscribe to this and to subscribe to that. And next thing you know, I'm paying all these little $5, $8, $12 subscriptions, getting some, some space on Apple or, or whatever it might be. And if you take time to realize how much money we're spending on those things, and sometimes I, you'll look at your, your, your bank statement and go, what am I spending money to that for? Where did that ever get started? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Take time to look through your expenses. Should I even be, be spending this? What can I give up? There's a difference between giving and generosity. Giving is what we do. It's an action. Generosity is who we are. Generosity is a mindset. It's not about an amount. It's about a mindset. And I I have two mindsets that I want to share with you, and then we're going to wrap this up. The first mindset when it comes to being generosity is not enough. There's a scripture in Haggai 1.6. And he says this, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. The New Living Translation says your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. How many of you have this perspective in life that it doesn't matter how much you make, it always feels like there's not enough? I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money, I have limited resources, not enough. Not enough isn't an amount, not enough is a mindset. Not enough isn't dependent on the amount of money. It could be, you could have $100, $1,000, a million dollars and still have this mentality, this mindset of I just don't have enough. The second mindset is more than enough. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that says the fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your lands and the young of your livestock. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. And you might have this mindset of of not enough and it's things feel very tight but I'm still gonna trust God. I find that God provides and gives me more than enough even when I'm not sure that I'm going to have enough. How many of you understand that? I don't know how it's going to happen, but I trust that God's going to make it happen. In God's economy, the math doesn't always work, but he always comes through. So these two mindsets, you can call it the bag mindset, not enough. The basket mindset, more than enough. God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory as I trust him. Here's the right perspective. And I'm just wrapping up with this. David prayed a prayer in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. David had a desire to build a house for God. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, they take an offering. And David gives a little bit of perspective about what he, what he is bringing. And I want to just turn to that if, if you can. This, this scripture is not going to be there, but in the first part of chapter 29. He wants to build the temple. And he knows that he's not, at this point, he knows that he's not going to be able to do it. It's going to be Solomon, his son. My son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, still young and inexperienced, the work ahead of him is enormous. For the temple that he will build is not for mere mortals, it is for the Lord himself. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. Now there is enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, and wood, as well as great quantities of onyx and other precious stones, costly jewels, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. And now because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I'm giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. They estimate that David gave, in our terms today, $20 billion of his own resources to build the temple. $20 billion. That's a lot of money. He was invested in it. And it goes on to show that people began to Uh, With his lead, they began to bring their own gold and silver and all of the different jewels.
And at the end it says, the people rejoiced over the offerings for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And King David was filled with joy. And I want to read this prayer that David prays. Verse 10. O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord. And this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, and you rule over everything. David sees that everything in the world belongs to God. It's all God's in the first place. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and praise you, your, your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything that we have comes from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. I think of my kids when they were small and they would give me a present and it was something in our house that I had bought or I had given to them and they were giving it back to me and I'm thinking, what in the world is a gift like this? But that's all the resources that they had. If we would just stop and realize all the resources that we have, it's not because of us. It's all God's. And we have to have this perspective. If we're going to have a more than enough perspective, we've got to understand none of this belongs to me. I don't own any of it. I'm just a steward of what God has given me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everything we have comes from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. We are here for only a moment, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon without a trace. O Lord our God, even this material that we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name comes from you. It all belongs to you. I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. You know I have done all this with good motives, and I have watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyously. O Lord, the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make your people always want to obey you. See to it that their love for you never changes. That's what God wants. He wants our heart. And he wants generosity. Generosity begets generosity. When we give, it's going to be given back to us. And I want to just challenge us all this morning to be generous in what we give and in what we do. Mark chapter 12, there's a story of people coming and putting their money into the temple treasury. And Jesus is there watching and it tells us that there were many rich people who brought in large amounts of money, put in large amounts of money into the offering. But he also sees a poor widow. And this poor widow put in two small copper coins worth very little. And he calls his disciples to himself and tells them this widow has put in more than all of those wealthy people for they have given a large amounts. They've given out of their abundance. But she gave out of her poverty everything that she had to live on. Everything. What they had given was just a, a, a scratch of the surface of what they, what they could have given. God measures our giving, giving differently than us. It's not about an amount. God doesn't need anything. When you give your tithes and your offerings today as you gave, God didn't need that. You needed that. For when we have things right in our heart and right in our perspective of who God is and who we are in his world and with his resources, we realize, I need this. I need this. This is for me. It's me setting priorities right in my life. I'm not dependent on myself. When I'm dependent on myself, I always come up short. It's like putting money into a pocket that has a hole in it. That's how it works when I'm leaning on my own resources and my own abilities. But I want this basket mentality that God, even though I may not have everything that I want, I know that I have everything that I need and you're providing everything for me. It's a perspective. The story of the widow's might shows that God measures things differently than us. 
He doesn't look at the amount. He looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the percentage. He looks at the sacrifice. He doesn't look at the surplus. He looks at our surrender. And what he values is giving that's motivated by love and faith and obedience. He's looking for a cheerful giver, one who is generous to honor him, not for our own recognition. And so we give not out of obligation, out of pressure or guilt, but with gratitude, with joy, as an act of worship, trusting, depending, and committing our lives to him, our love for God and our love for other people. And so the question today is, how, how do we respond to this message? It seems like the right thing to do would be to take an offering, right? You don't want to give in an offering. I could ask you for an offering right now when I'm asking about being generous, but we're not receiving an offering. We don't have a project today. We're just talking about where is our heart and that, this perspective of generosity. Are we generous? Has God been generous with you? So how do we respond this morning? I want to ask that you just bow your heads and ask this question, Holy Spirit, what are you, what are you saying to me? How do you want me to respond? My ask this morning as pastor is that all of us would commit to generosity because the days that we live in are so materialistic, so selfish, so self-centered, which draws people away from God. As I said earlier, generosity is the cure. Paul wrote Timothy. About the last days, he said, know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be difficult times. People will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Where is our heart? The only way to overcome all of these things is to give. And every time you give to God, your heart grows bigger toward him. You give your money to someone else, you're gonna have a passion for that person. You give to God and you're gonna grow in your relationship with God because your heart follows your treasure. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us this morning? How do you want us to respond? Lord, I pray today that we would plan that we would plan, God, have a plan for our finances, that we would live obedient to you, trusting you with our money, trusting you with everything that we have, and giving you all, God, that, that you want us to do. May we just follow your spirit, follow your leading, grow us in this area of generosity to help us to see your kingdom advanced in this world. May we be invested in that and not so much invested in the things that we see going on in our world. God, deliver those today who are struggling, feeling like they just can't do this. But God, I know that as they honor you with first fruits, as they honor you with their giving above and beyond their, their tithe, God, that there is such a blessing and a joy that comes in honoring you and realizing, God, that this is all from you. Everything I have is from you. You gave me the resources. You've given me the abilities, God. And all that I have belongs to you. And you're generous to, to give us so much. Lord, we just want you. We want you to as you listen to God and what he would ask you to do, how to respond. Maybe it's the fact that you and your spouse need to sit down and make a plan if you don't have a plan. We're coming up to a new year. It's always a good time to start. God, what do you want us to do? And how do you want us to respond and see that God is faithful to his word, that when we give, it will be given back to us a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, that he'll pour out a blessing so much so that there's not room enough to receive it. 
God, we respond to you today. With your heads bowed and your eyes still closed, the greatest act of generosity ever in the world was God giving his own son, Jesus. He came from heaven. He left his throne. He left his kingdom to come to sinful earth, to live among us for the purpose of dying. He came from heaven to earth to take your place, to pay your price for your sins so that you can live with him forever in heaven. Today, if there's someone in the room and you don't know Jesus, you haven't made him Lord of your life, and you realize that you have a need, you realize that you're lost, you're without him, you have no future, no plan, no purpose. On our own, we'll make a mess of things, but God has a plan and purpose for your life, and today you're realizing, I need God more than anything. And just by responding today, you would just say, Pastor Jeff, that's me. I need Jesus, and I'm asking him into my heart, into my life, to be my Lord, to guide and lead my life. Is there anyone here today? like this has been a little solemn and maybe it's just because I've drove 3,000 miles this week and I feel tired. Maybe I'm reading the response differently, but would you do this for me this week and in the days moving forward? Ask this question, am I generous? Can I be generous? Will I be generous with what God has given to me? Lord, I pray for your people today that as we leave this place, God, we praise you for everything that you've blessed us with. You've given us so much. And I pray that we would see, as David did, that it all is from you and it all belongs to you. It's just us giving back what you've already given to us. May we be faithful in everything that you've given to us, honoring you in every way. Jesus, guide our lives. Show us. We listen to your voice. We follow your leading. We follow your plans and your purposes for us, especially in this area of our finances, our money, and our giving. God, help us to be obedient to you and help us to be generous beyond as you have been so generous and so blessed our lives. May we honor that. May we worship you, God, with our lives, with our finances, realizing, God, you are going to always provide for us. And as we so generously, God, you're going to bless us in a generous way. Help us, God. We need your help. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. Get some rest. Get some sleep. Get on a treadmill. Work off those mashed potatoes. Go find a class today to be part of. This is the end of this quarter. Next quarter starts next Sunday. We love you. God bless you.